Okie doke. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started here. So um, today's uh, speaker is Stephen Packer. Uh, Stephen has a PhD in geology from Rutgers University. Um, and he then went to do a, a postdoc at Lamont Dirty Earth Observatory uh, before becoming a professor in paleoceanography and climate uh, and uh, Antarctic glacial history at, at Queen's College, CUNY. Um, Stephen's current work uh, focus on paleoceanography and paleoclimate changes in the Southern Ocean region. And without further ado, uh, Stephen, can you can you take it over, please? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Craig. And I want to thank you for inviting me to give this talk here. And also, I want to thank everyone who's watching to take the time out, uh, for whether it's the NASA guest people, uh, some of my students, hopefully, are online, friends and family. So welcome. Okay, so as Craig mentioned, is um, I'm going to be talking about today ice volume ch changes during times of elevated atmospheric CO2 and just ask the question, can we use this to try to predict about the future? And so the talk outline is going to be that I'm going to first introduce some of the paleoclimate climate records and the CO2 records. And then I'm going to talk about how we can actually back out sea level changes from or ice volume changes from records from that are millions to tens of millions of years old. And to do this, two of the techniques that I use, I'm gonna talk about today, there's others, but I won't talk about them, is backstripping from passive continental margins, as well as geochemical means, using oxygen isotopes and magnesium calcium ratios. I'll then talk about some of them, I'll talk about different time slices uh, through this uh, parts of the Cenozoic that had different levels of atmospheric CO2. For example, the late Miocene. It had similar CO2 levels to pre-industrial levels. And uh, so the question kind of begs, well, if we're at uh, pre-industrial levels, could we have some Northern Hemisphere glaciation? Some significant one, more than just the Greenland ice sheet. I'll talk about that and some evidence for or against that. And then we'll go further back in time, back to about 14 to 16 million years ago, the middle Miocene climatic optimum where CO2 levels were definitely much higher than today. We're talking about 500 to maybe 550 parts per million. And just to remind ourselves, today's level is at four, a little over 400 parts per million, and which is about 40% higher than pre-industrial levels. We'll go further back in time to the Oligocene, uh, between 23 and 34 million years ago when CO2 was even higher than today, maybe up to 700, maybe 800 parts per million. Uh, we do have uncertainty as you get higher CO2 levels, the error bars grow. And then finally, I'll have a, just a few slides at the end on the middle Miocene, which is from 41 to 49 million years ago, where CO2 levels were much higher than 700, in many cases, over a thousand parts per million. And then to end it, I'll have a couple slides on basically just saying, um, can we use these paleoclimate climate records to try to predict our future? And I'll talk about some of the caveats, the obvious one, time scale differences in thermal inertia, as well as as you go further back in time, um, the ocean, oceanic uh, currents and circulation, as well as tectonics, will increasingly become more and more different from, from the present. And so, so here's a record from, uh, of CO2. It's from, uh, from 2013. And basically the y-axis is atmospheric CO2 and the x-axis is millions of years ago with zeros today, going back to 60 million years ago. And as you can see that today we have, we have uh, the CO2 levels shown in dashed lines, 400 parts per million and pre-industrial 280. CO2 levels stay within that boundary, maybe a little lower, for a big chunk of the last 20 million years. There's a couple of times where CO2 gets above that. One of them is the middle of Miocene warm period, MPWP, about 3 million years ago. Another time period where we have just some pre-industrial levels is the late Miocene, and we're going to talk about that. And then we have the middle Miocene climatic optimum, where you can see CO2 levels are significantly higher than whether pre-industrial as well as today. But if you really want to go back when CO2 levels were permanently above what we have, the levels of today, we have to go back into the Oligocene older than 23 million years ago. And I'm going to talk about the late Oligocene, the Eocene Oligocene boundary. That's the big transition. I'll tell you about that in terms of climate. And then 
the super warm period of the Cenozoic, which is the Eocene, where CO2 levels were well over 1,000 and probably approaching maybe 1,500 to 2,000 parts per million, in fact. And so the next slide here introduces us to some of the proxies. And I'm going to go into detail of how each of these proxies uh, we, we can tease out the climate and sea level records from these different proxies. Again, the x-axis is millions of years ago. And, and the top figure here is CO2 that I just talked about. And then I'm going to talk about oxygen isotopes. And oxygen isotopes, uh, in the simplest form, the larger the values, the colder the climate, the lower the values, the warmer the climate. And so today, we have some of the coldest climates that we've seen in the last 50 or 60 million years, the last 2 million years of, Earth's, of Earth. We can also look at deep water temperatures. And this is through a proxy called magnesium calcium. And again, we can see cold bottom water temperatures today in the last couple of million years and getting warmer until they reach over 10 degrees Celsius warmer than today. The last proxy I'm going to talk about is sea level, is the pro uh, how we can back out sea level and therefore ice volume. And these are sea level records from basically looking at water depth changes from passive margins. So let's talk, since this talk is about sea level and ice volume, let's talk about how much ice we have today. And today, on Greenland, if we melted all the ice, sea level would rise about seven meters, about seven meters. The West Antarctic ice sheet that's mainly below sea level, okay, the, the grounded ice is below sea level, would only raise about sea level about three meters. But the big cohote right here is East Antarctica, where if you melted the entire ice sheet, sea level would rise about 58 meters. And so the Antarctic continent is where most of the ice resides today. Um, and if we melted all the ice, this is the way the continent would look like. And that's with, because the ice has weight. The weight uh, weighs down on the lithosphere, sinks into the stenosphere. If you move it instantaneously, it's going to take tens of thousands of years for the lithosphere to isostatically rebound. So this the figure on the right here shows the Antarctic continent once you remove the ice and isostatically rebound the lithosphere. And you can see that still, West Antarctica stays well below sea level for the most part. All the blue represents below sea level. And so how do we measure ice volume and global sea level? What are some of the methods? Well, first of all, let me give you some definitions. First one is used to sea, which is global sea level. And that's been defined for decades. And it's the rise or fall of sea level relative to the center of the earth. And unfortunately, if we're talking about ice melting from Antarctica, and that water goes into the ocean. That's a volume of water, ice turning into water going into the oceans. Used to see is not that, okay? And so what I did a couple of years ago was say, let's try to have apples equal to apples here, where uh, we have on a sea level estimate that's equal to the volume of the water that's either going into the ice or melting out of the ice and going into the ocean. And I called that apparent sea level. And that's just basically taking out the effects of water loading on the crust. Um, Robert from 2014, he came up with a similar, um, a, a similar term, eustatic sea level, and these are basically equivalent. So if you know his work, um, then it's, uh, it's basically the same thing, same concept. So one way we could back out sea level is to look at stratigraphic records from shallow water sections on continental margins. However, we got a problem here. The problem is that we have a triad of processes that control the stratigraphic record. First of all, used to see ASL, ESL, whatever you want to call it, as well as other components that would need to be isolated and removed so we can get that um, um, global sea level signal. And that's tectonics, whether it's subsidence or uplift, loading subsidence, uh, compaction of the sediments below, thermal subsidence, and then you must take in to account the flexural response from loading, whether it's from water or from sediments or from thermal subsidence uh, from distal areas, from maybe 50, 100, hundreds of kilometers away. And if you're in a thick crust, it can flexurally, the subsidence can flexurally um, in a, involve your site. And then of course we have sediment supply basically filling in this, uh, the basin. 
The other way to look at it uh, is to look at oxygen isotopes. And again, unfortunately, oxygen isotopes has multiple variables controlling the oxygen isotope bear, um, uh, values. We, one of them is ice volume and temperature, and I'll talk about both of those. I have a slide for those just to introduce them. And then there's other aspects, evaporation and precipitation, and that's a minor effect. That can be modeled out or uh, deciphered out. And then there's other ones like vital effects and so on and so forth. To back out the ice volume signal from oxygen isotopes, we use now use magnesium calcium ratios. Magnesium calcium gives us water temperature estimates. So we can isolate the ice volume or the, as we put it, the oxygen isotope value of seawater. And then finally, we can also look at direct evidence, which is ice raft of debris, glacial deposits, uh, as well as well, I was on a couple of uh, Antarctic expeditions, drilling near Antarctica, and, um, and that was quite successful as well. So those are some of the main methods. So let's talk about each one individually. And the first one is estimating global sea level from shallow marine stratigraphy. And the way we do that is through backstripping. It's an iterative process. You can do it two-dimensionally, or if you're an oil company of lots of wells, you can do it probably three-dimensionally. And what I mean by iterative process, we, on the right here, if we have a sediment profile here called, a thickness called A, we remove it. And then we, one-dimensionally decompact all the sediments below it using porosity curves. Next we do is we unload the sediments below because that sediment had weight, was weighing down on the lithosphere, that we have to um, uh, account for that. Whoops. And then finally, uh, we will also look at water loading as well as lithospheric cooling because even though this crust like uh, on the east coast of North America is 170 million years old, it's still uh, slowly, especially when you go further afield near the shelf break, there is some thermal subsidence as well that's flexually transmitted to our sites that's along the coastal plain. So that's the iterative process. So what did we use? Well, um, Miller um, and Associates uh, developed the New Jersey Coastal Transect uh, Plain, um, a coastal plain transect. This has been going on for about 30 years now. It's still going on, in fact. And um, where we've been, uh, uh, whoops, I don't know why that's going back, uh, drill, uh, where we uh, drilled many sites, some of ODP sites, some of state sites, uh, to back up hilly environments and sea level. My research was on the Oligocene, so I'm gonna focus on the Oligocene. I looked at eight different sites and constructed a strike line based on the Cretaceous outcrops and projected the sites onto a dip profile. These sites are shown here, seven out of the eight in this case. We just didn't include Jobs Point, one of them. And these O1s and E's and uh, KW's are just sequences. And sequences are, are sedimentary units that are bounded by unconformities, which is inferred sea level lowering. And so we have the sites. Here's a dip profile at kilometers and miles in here. And the next thing we had to do the first step was to decompact the sediments. And this figure here shows the decompacted sediments. This is the thickness in meters. Here's all eight sites here showing the thicknesses. These letters here are the biophases of the foraminifers. And foraminifers are one-celled creatures uh, that are very sensitive to environmental changes. And in shallow marine sections, like on the continental shelf, uh, water depth uh, that they basically uh, um, can be used to estimate water depth changes. We found 10 biophases, benthoform and biophases, um, where A is the shallowest and H and J, I and J were the deepest. Once we decompact the sediments, we then reconstruct the straddle geometry of the shelf, performing two dimensional flexural backstripping. And uh, this is with the subsidence from loading, from thermo all flexurally done. And the result is that we reconstruct the straddle geometry of the margin. These timelines here are from 27 million years to 25.8 million years. And you can see this prograding wedge going out. And what this is actually, this is the Paleo Shelf. Today, the Paleo Shelf break off of New Jersey is about 200 kilometers offshore. Back in the Oligocene, the Paleo Shelf was way closer to the shoreline of New Jersey today, sea level was higher. This was the shelf break 
at around 27, uh, 25 million years ago, just offshore in New Jersey. So from that point, what we can do is we include now the formidable biophases. And like I said, they, um, we had 10 biophases from A to J, and where A is and B are the shallowest. And so, and they have uh, much smaller error bars or uncertainty because the range that the four minute biophases live in is, uh, is narrower because it's in shallower water. And here we have 20 meters plus or minus 10. And these are different straddle sur sur surfaces. Um, the two different lines, color of the blue and uh, the dash blue, is just using high and low porosity. Same thing with the green line, which is another surface 27.7 million years. And the result is, is that we can, first of all, um, help calibrate deeper water biophases, um, shown especially in this lower one, where this is biophases B from three different straddle surfaces. And, and what's so beautiful about this method and having eight different sites is that this method has this internal consistency. So we reconstruct the straddle geometry for three different time slices. For example, here, biophases B is all around 25 meters of water depth. And then we can also better constrain deeper water biophases. As you can see, the uncertainties, the plus or minus, increases because the environments become more stable as you get into deeper waters. The result is, is that we can, once we have taken out all the other signals, from the stratigraphic record, we are left with global sea level, which means that the formidable biophases water depth changes that we see is actually now global sea level. And so I won't take you through the whole thing, but these are different straddle surfaces, 31.1, 31.0. And basically this is, I can, it's uh, five minutes to walk you through the whole thing. But basically in a nutshell, we look at how water depth changes are changing from each time surface and then constructing a global sea level chart from those, okay? And the result is, is that we have global sea level for, for the Oligocene. And this is just showing uh, for the late Oligocene where the x-axis is age, and the y-axis is uh, used to see. Blue dark blue line is our best estimate, but the uncertainty we have to show for error bars, I believe that. Anybody who knows Michelle Comins, she was actually my, uh, my committee, uh, she showed me that showing off your error bars is actually a positive thing. It's actually good to show those off. And so this is basically mainly from the uncertain, uh, not the uncertain, the range in the four minerful biophases water depths. So that's how we do how we could calculate global sea level from stratigraphic margins. Now let's move over to geochemical processes. And the most successful paleoclimate proxy for the Cenozoic is oxygen isotopes. And we basically, and simply, we look at two isotopes, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. 18 has two extra neutrons. And the result is, is that it's um, when water evaporates from the oceans, Oxygen 16s are preferentially evaporated out, leaving the eight more 18s behind. So if the water here has an oxygen isotope value of zero, let's call it zero per mil, when it evaporates, um, more of the eight 16s are evaporated. And as the water vapor moves toward the poles, the higher latitudes, more of the, more of the uh, 18s rain out more easily leaving the water vapor enriched in oxygen 16s. By the time we get up to the poles, uh, the snow is heavily enriched in oxygen 16. So you can imagine an ice sheet forming, getting su uh, super enriched in oxygen 16s. The result is that the oceans are gonna become enriched in oxygen 18s. And so therefore we can actually measure oxygen isotopes in the shells of those mi of microscopic organisms called foraminifers to back out global sea level or ice volume. However, there's a caveat here. And the caveat is, is that uh, when the oxygen isotopes gets incorporated into the carbonate, there's a temperature effect on the oxygen isotope values. And so we have unfortunately two variables and only one equation. And, and in seventh grade algebra, that was bad. Remember your teacher? Can't have two variables in one equation. And so, 
So we have to somehow remove or make some assumptions about temperature and oxygen isotope values to try to back out sea level slash ice volume. But before I do that, I just want to show you a picture of these foraminiferas. Um, if anyone has looked at paleo -ocean oceanographic uh, papers and they had oxygen isotope records, almost invariably they're using Sibisidoides. And this is uh, Sibisidoides. This is actually Mundulus, the species is Mundulus. You can see how beautiful they, uh, these are. These are probably about 300 to 400 microns or 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters across. Uvidrinas are used less, but they are but they also calcify uh, uh, oxygen isotopes in the equilibrium with the seawater. And so, so let's talk about oxygen isotope records. This is the one from Jim Zakos from 2008. The y-axis is, uh, is age and oxygen isotope values are on, on the x-axis. Big take home message real fast for people who don't know about this is that higher values represent colder bottom water temperatures and or more ice and lower temperatures, uh, oxygen isotope values represent warmer bottom water temperatures and or less ice. So you can see today we are living in among the coldest record um, climates of the last couple of million years. And in fact, the last two million years has been colder with more ice than any time of the last 250 million years. Okay, well, well off this record. And then as you can see, we have um, warming and less ice. And then we get into the Eocene where there's either no ice or perhaps, and I would like to see if I can convince you that there could have been some ephemeral, ephemeral ice sheets in the Eocene. So what can we tell just about this record? Well, a few things. And that is with uh, values of greater than 2.1 per mil. Uh, there has to be some ice, significant ice, um, in the world. And that's because otherwise um, bottom water temperatures would be colder than today. That wouldn't make sense. So, so values of around three per mil are consistent with a fully glaciated East Antarctic ice sheet, but a little bit warmer than today, probably more like a Greenland ice sheet. And if you uh, and values of around 3.3 .3 per mil are consistent with a fully glaciated Antarctic ice sheet, as well as temperatures that are approaching modern day. And so you can see right off the bat that in the Eocene, we don't have, based on oxygen isotopes, we don't have to invoke any ice. But once we get to 34 million years ago at the start of the Oligocene, there's a significant continental ice uh, throughout the Oligocene, maybe in the middle Miocene, uh, to, uh, and we'll talk about that, that there could have been some significant melting as well. But we can use different proxies to try to uh, remove, uh, to, to get it down to one uh, variable, one equation. And one way is to do what I did, which is I already had some, I had sea level uh, changes and estimates from the Oligocene, apparent sea level here. And I basically looked at those amplitudes and compared them to the amplitudes of oxygen isotopes from different e glacial events through the Oligocene and then calibrated them for different sites. And so uh, these sites, this, uh, the blue is for um, uh, high latitude, green is for mid latitude and pink and red are from low latitude sites. And these are the calibrations. Now, unlike uh, Rick Fairbanks's um, papers on the late Pleistocene where he calibrated oxygen isotopes to sea level, uh, where he made some assumptions about, uh, about the temperature. These calibrations include, include the temperature. And the reason why each calibration from each side is different is because they're in different ocean basins. And so the temperature, the bottom water masses are going to fluctuate differently and bring in different uh, variations on temperature through um, in each basin, okay? And so we can do that. And so I'll show you some figures that use that we are basically calibrated oxygen isotopes to sea level. Another way to do it is to use magnesium calcium ratios. And magnesium calcium ratios is an independent recorder of water temperature during calcification of the shells. In this case, we're looking at foraminiferas. So it, it can use to be used to isolate original isotopic seawater values and therefore constrain ice volume. However, there's some caveats and there's some problems with this. Some of them have been um, taken care of and eliminated, like deep burial tends to raise 
on them uh, magnesium calcium values. Dissolution lowers magnesium calcium. And then we have that magnesium, uh, the magnesium ions and calcium ions change through time, through the Cenozoic over the last tens of millions of years. However, there's been a number of studies. And even though there's some uncertainty, um, I feel pretty confident, at least for the last 30 million years, especially, that you can back that out. The biggest problem uh, magnesium calcium has had is with the saturation ion state of, cal of, uh, of decarbonates. And so, and this actually started with, um, I found this out from doing a study. I was working on a site from uh, south of Tasmania on the slope, site 1168 and water depths around 2,600 meters. Paleo water depth was about 2,600 meters, well above the CCD. So there shouldn't be any dissolution. And um, the y-axis here is, is age 16 to 18 million years. And so what I did is I developed oxygen isotope records using Cibisodoides, and then used bottom water temperatures also using Cibisodoides, which is an epifaunal foraminiferin. Epifaunal means it lives on the sea surface, so it's in contact with the water. And from there, I was able to back out the oxygen isotope value of seawater, which is shown here. I don't show sea level here because we started, I started recognizing some possible problems. And where during glacial maximum, we have warmer bottom water temperatures and glacial minimas, we have cooler bottom water temperatures. So it's an anti-correlation taking place. Ouch, okay. So, so this could be due to iron saturation, which it probably is. Or my first thought, and I almost started writing a paper on this, but I didn't. So the, this is actually just from an abstract, that there could be possibly deep water circulation changes where we could have warmer deep water during glacial intervals. I said, wow, this could be an amazing paper. Well, the very next year, Carrie Lear and others, and Carrie is one of the best geochemists with working with this proxy with her and Yael Rosenthal from Rutgers University. Um, they've, they've worked for a decade to try to make this uh, proxy work for water temperatures. So she developed a site from site 1218 from the Central Pacific where um, the black, well, first of all, uh, the y-axis is age here and the x-axis is the oxygen isotope value of seawater, which is a proxy for uh, which is basically a sea level. And then the blue is uh, magnesium calcium temperatures. And first of all, so we have warmer temperatures to the right. We have less ice to the right as well. And as a matter of fact, you can probably, you're probably already seeing a problem here, okay? Where basically we're seeing uh, this anti-correlation once again. And this is not near my site. This is in a deep, this is in a deep Pacific. And so again, there seems to be a problem uh, with magnesium calcium. And so uh, Carrie Lear and others worked using lithium calcium ratios, uh, looking at shallow water sites and many, other, and many other aspects to try to make this proxy work. And for me to, and I took these slides out for a time issue, and the cut to the quick is that we do have a happy ending. Eldersfield and Lear and others recognize that, look, if, if the problem is a carbonate ion saturation, if we, instead of using an epifaunal foram, we use an infaunal, slightly infaunal, which so it's inside the sediments, um, it's the sediments all made of carbonate and that carbonate should be able to buffer and keep the carbonate ion saturation from, uh, from low rank. And so elders feel sort of using infaunal species and the one that works the best was the autosalis. And in fact, I'm using, um, developing two records right now, using paired oxygen isotopes, using Cibisodoides, and magnesium calcium from autosolus in the bottom. And the take home message is, it's this method seems to work the best. And so, so it looks like magnesium using this, uh, this method seems to work where we're truly getting um, more realistic uh, and very accurate bottom water temperatures. So let's now move into the next part of, our, of my talk here which is uh, we're gonna talk about the different slice time slices that I'm, uh, that I'm, that I'm gonna try to, that I've been working on. First of all, let's take a look at this diagram. Uh, age is in the y-axis. This is uh, atmospheric CO2 uh, going back to the Paleocene from different records. And this is sea level 
from Miller et al, as well as my ligacine study right in here. And I would, and so the first time slice I'm gonna look at is the late Miocene. And this is a time when we have basically pre-industrial levels to maybe modern. And the question begs, well, could we have in pre-industrial levels, could we have perhaps some northern hemisphere glaciation? Significant. If we go further back in time in the middle Miocene, so CO2 is much higher than today, probably about 550. And uh, I want to talk about what happened, what some of the best estimates are for ice volume and sea level during this a time of higher elevated CO2. The late Oligocene is kind of a conundrum because we have CO2 dropping while oxygen isotopes are also falling, which suggests warming. So how much warming is really taking place in a world where CO2 is actually falling? And then I'll talk about the, uh, the base of the Oligocene, which is basically the, the most uh, abrupt, permanent, climatic transition of the Cenozoic. And then I'll finally finish off with the uh, Eocene, which is basically the, the hothouse world of when CO2 was probably over a thousand parts per, per million at some point. So let's talk about the late Miocene. The late Miocene is sandwiched between the warming of, of the mid Pliocene, three million years ago, as well as right over here, the middle Miocene climatic optimum between 14 and 16 million years ago. So this diagram here is from Ann Holborn. This is the best record for this time period in terms of oxygen isotopes. And this is the oxygen isotope record here. Here's time in millions of years ago. Here's the middle Miocene climatic optimum. Much lower values suggest that we have a much warmer climate. And then we have the transition going into the cold period. And here's the late Miocene it looks pretty dull compared to the middle Miocene. So CO2 levels are near pre-industrial and Antarctic ice sheet is relatively stable. And so during the late Miocene, our, um, in terms of trying to understand sea level, during an expedition I was on about 10 years ago, it was near Antarctica, IODP site U1361, um, we suddenly recovered 40 meters of late Miocene nanofossil chalk. Why is that unusual? Because starting from the earlier Miocene and st straight up through the Miocene, um, the Southern Ocean is extremely corrosive. The waters are extremely corrosive. And so the CCD is extremely shallow. And in our site, which was in 3000 meters of water depth, we weren't finding any uh, calcareous mi uh, microfossils. And suddenly for about 40 meters, we get nanofossil chalk. And in fact, the scientists, I was coming on shift and the scientists came running up to me, Steve, Steve, we got, we got carbonates. Because I was actually the foraminiferous on, on, the, on this expedition. And so they were happy for me. So anyway, um, I had a master's student work on this, but unfortunately the foraminiferous were diagenetically altered. So the oxygen isotope values uh, were, were basically nonsense. So a colleague asked, the question going, well, Steve, if maybe this is not a local event, maybe it's regional around Antarctica, look around Antarctica, see if there's any other sites. And lo and behold, there was one other site, uh, site 689, which is on the other side of Antarctica, um, basically south of Africa. And, um, and that had nanofossil chalks. It was described in the initial result, but no one ever decided to do any research on it, thank goodness. So my master's student suddenly had a great project. And uh, basically with these two sites, we were able to say that we discovered a, a carbonate preservation event in the Southern Ocean that occurred uh, during about 11.9 to 11.2 million years ago. And this permitted a construction of the isot of isotope records very close to Antarctica. And so, so the takeaway, Oh, I forgot. The takeaway here is the higher oxygen isotope values is equal to ice volume that's probably greater than modern. So let me show you this figure here before I go on. This is age here in the y-axis. This oxygen isotope values converted to calcite. Remember when I said 3.3 was considered a full glaciated Antarctic ice sheet? Well, look at these values in here, over four per mil, over four per mil. And this suggests to us that it was uh, probably extremely cold water, probably near like modern day values, like zero degrees Celsius for the water temperatures, but also had to be ice 
more ice than we could fit on Antarctica. And so uh, this is a figure, and I'll just point out again, this is age and y-axis, oxygen isotopes here, and this is the oxygen isotope record that he developed. And what we did, since we only got two magnesium calcium um, ratios that are shown here, uh, we said, okay, let's take a look at, let's use modern bottom water temperatures along mud rise. And today the modern uh, temperatures are negative one to about, to about 1.5 degrees Celsius. So let's back out and estimate constrained ice volume based on this. And so over here, GIV is global ice volume percent. So 100 is today's ice volume using, and we uh, um, calculated ice volume <coughs> at negative one, the value is based on negative one water temperature, zero and one. Let's just use the coldest bottom water temperatures because that will produce the least amount of ice volume. And during this MI glacial event, this uh, event called MI5, we have ice volume approaching at least half of the global ice volume of today. And so the big takeaway here is that significant northern hemisphere glaciation probably occurred about 8 million years earlier than we previously thought before. We thought it was the late Pliocene, early Pleistocene, where we had larger ice volume than today, significantly larger ice volume to net than today. And so, and so, um, and I would like to actually work on different glacial events in the late Miocene and see if there's other um, times when ice volume got significantly greater um, the Northern Hemisphere glaciation got significantly greater than today. And what I mean by greater is bigger than the Greenland ice sheet, okay? So let's move deeper back into time. Let's go into the Middle Miocene. This is a figure from Ann Holborn. We won't talk, this is looking at uh, Milankovitch cycles, which we want to talk about right now. Let's focus in on the oxygen isotope values in here, where we have, this is age, and the Middle Miocene, the values are much higher, much lower than today's, indicating that we have a much warmer climate. And indeed, carbon dioxide is much higher, uh, probably uh, up to maybe about 500 parts per million during this time. And so, so an excellent record was uh, from Miller et al. in 2017, where he basically used something similar to what I used, where he developed an oxygen isotope record, and then he used backstrips uh, stratigraphy that had sea level estimates from the New Jersey coastal plain for the Miocene, and then calibrated it to back out sea level. So this is a sea level chart here, and the big take home message here is that a couple of them, the first one is that unlike the Pleistocene, where glacial events are controlled uh, by the 100K eccentricity cycle, uh, the big sea level events or ice volume events during the Miocene was controlled by the 1.2 million year obliquity cycle, where we have, where the obliquity cycle, the 40K cycle, has, um, has these um, low amplitude variances that occur approximately 1.2 million years. And this seems to be controlling is, or was the dominant sea level cycle of the Miocene. The other big take home message is that his estimates suggest that up to 50% uh, that uh, up to, there was up to a 50 meter sea level rise during the warm period, which means that most of the Antarctic ice sheet probably melted away. The eccentricity cycles do play a role and sea level, and, but it's not the 100K eccentricity cycle, it's the long eccentricity cycle, the 400K cycle, where they saw smaller amplitudes of about 20 meters of sea level change during this time period. So uh, another record was also calibrating um, oxygen isotopes at sea level. This is from a paper from a couple of years ago, where again, age is in a y-axis. These are two records, oxygen isotope records, uh, 1218 in red and 1090 in blue. And then I calibrated them to sea level. And one of the take home messages for this is that at, the, at least at the start of the middle Miocene climatic optimum, ice volume decreased by 50 to maybe 75% lower than today. Or the ice sheet, remaining ice sheet was maybe 25 to 50% of the modern global ice volume. 
And the other part is that in the early Miocene, we have sea level events or, or glacial events where ice may have gotten up to 25% larger than the modern global ice volume average. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, excuse me, Steve, wait a second. How do we get an ice sheet bigger than Antarctica unless you want to invoke Northern Hemisphere glaciation? Well, in this case, I probably don't. And if you wait just a couple slides, I think I'll be able to convince you how we can get a bigger ice sheet on Antarctica. So let's go further back in time. Let's go back to the Oligocene between 23 and approximately 34 million years ago. Uh, CO2 is even higher than the Miocene, probably be up to maybe, maybe 800 parts per million. Sea level raised from about 40 meters below the, the modern to maybe 30 meters above the modern. And this ice volume ranged from about 40% of the ice volume of modern to maybe 40% maybe above modern global ice volume. This record here, what I show you y-axis again in, in, uh, is millions of years ago. This is the record from uh, site 1218. This is just one record, so it's not a composite record. So any sort of temperature variation is just, we're not gonna see any uh, changes as we go from one uh, record to another. This is uh, CO2, where you can see CO2 is still relatively high during the lower part of the, the early part of the Oligocene, but decreases during the late Oligocene. And that's a kind of an interesting story that I hope to share with you in a couple of slides. Now, let's talk about the size, the topography of the Antarctic continent. Today, if you removed all the ice and isostatically rebounded it, this is the way Antarctica would look. Blue represents below sea level. So most of West Antarctica or big parts of it is underwater, as well as parts of uh, East Antarctica like Pritz Bay, Totten Glacier, excuse me, and uh, Wilkes Land. Um, and so uh, Wilson and others, through a series of papers, they reconstructed the, um, the topography of Antarctica at the very base of the Oligocene, just before the ice started. And, and they estimated erosion, and there's a, literally up to kilometers of erosion taking place along the uh, Antarctic continent, as well as they took into account subsidence of the Antarctic continent, and the result is startling. Oops. And the result is startling. Where up to 25% more land area existed on the Antarctic continent than today. And that would result in up to 1.4 times the amount of ice volume of the modern. It's equivalent to if all that ice melted on a fully glaciated Oligocene Antarctic continent, ice would, um, it would, a sea level would rise about 85 meters. Okay, and so, and so this is from the paper from 2013, the last paper, where they show modern topography and how much ice there would be. It would be equivalent if it all melted to about 57 meters. And then they had um, basically a topography with minimum uplift and erosion, and then a maximum topography. And, and the minimum and maximum topography results in ice sheets that are over 80 meters a sea level equivalent. Okay, today we're talking about 57, 58, or okay, if you include East Antarctica, it's about 62. And so we're talking about a much larger continent in terms of land mass, and therefore larger ice volume. And that's how we can explain um, the idea that we can have more ice in the Oligocene. And probably uh, we don't know when the erosion, uh, when all the erosion took place. And so maybe all, all the way into the, most of the, the early and middle Miocene. Okay. So going, can, uh, continue with the Oligocene, another aspect is what controls the big sea level events. And it was starting to get recognized in the late early 90s by Miller et al. in 1991. Uh, where we had these big glacial events. And as we uh, were, got better dating and more high resolution records of sea level and ice volume, it pointed to a Milankovitch causal mechanism. And in this case, it's obliquity. And as I mentioned before, obliquity has these low uh, amplitude variances that occur every one, approximately 1.2 million years. So this is the y-axis is age again. This is eccentricity from, and uh, for the people who, no eastern um, uh, obliquity. Obliquity ranges from 22 degrees up to about 24 degrees. So during high obliquity, 
higher obliquity, we, uh, the obliquity is changing every 40,000 years from 24 to 22, and so on and so forth. During low obliquity variance, it stays around 23. And during each one of these 1.2 million year uh, low variance in the obliquity cycle, this seems to be an oxygen isotope increase in most cases, except for a couple instances right here. And so, and so, so, it, uh, so what, what, what is the problem here? Well, you know, if we only have a 20 or 30 meter sea level change in the oxygen isotope values, that could be 0.3 per mil, 0.25 if the ice is not too cold. It could be lost in this signal in here, okay? And so we again turn to shallow water stratigraphy. And so we're, this would be, um, oh, I, I cut out the H. But these are the sequences for the oligocene. And the light a lavender here is the sea level events and is an excellent correlation, a one to one correspondence for a low obliquity shown here and sea level falls. And this and these um, and this record here, all the different colors, is uh, oxygen isotope records that has been calibrated to sea level. And so the uh, the take home message here is that indeed it looks like uh, that the big ice volume events of the Oligocene and the Miocene, at least up until the middle Miocene, are controlled by the 1.2 million year obliquity cycle. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about, uh, one of the last things I want to talk about with the Oligocene is the late Oligocene. Because the late Oligocene is interesting because we have lowering CO2 values and at the same time, we have oxygen isotope values that are decreasing as well. And that suggests either less ice and or warmer bottom water temperatures. And that's uh, what, is, what is going on here. Does that mean that there's a decoupling between CO2 and climate? Well. Part of the answer is right here. See these values right here? This is from a record from site 690, which is proximal to Antarctica. And these values stay high. It was super low resolution. It was done in 1990. Uh, but those values stay high while the rest of the records decrease, while the rest of the records decrease. And so, and so I had a PhD student develop a high resolution record for 690. And lo and behold, those few little values that we saw in the previous one were not just some aliasing of the record. Indeed, uh, 690 shows high values through most of the late oligocene. So here again, age here in the y-axis, oxygen isotopes in the x-axis. The dark blue line is site 690. This little dashed line here is three per mil. And you can see that indeed the oxygen isotope values stay high during the entire record until we, we get the hiatus here at around 24.5 million years ago. In contrast, look, take a look at the other oxygen isotope records. And here's these different sites from the Atlantic and Pacific Basin. They're all diverging away from site 690, from the record of 690. And so, so the take home message here is that that was, these records are being bathed by warmer deep waters, bottom waters. And, and it suggests that a uh, warmer deep water mass bathed most of the ocean basins during most of the, during most of the late Oligocene. This also suggests with values of over three per mil, and even the lowest ones around 2.6 per mil, um, this suggests that ice bond did not decrease as much as the other records have concluded, okay? And so that's the late Oligocene conundrum, and I think it's um, pretty solved right now. So let's finish off the Oligocene by looking at the transition from the Eocene to the Oligocene. And this is the biggest, most, this is the largest permanent rapid climatic transition of the Cenozoic. This is where oxygen isotopes increase by well over one per mil. This, that, that's a function of temperature as well as ice volume. And the ice volume estimates range from anything from a 50 meters up to over 80 meters of sea level fall, resulting in an ice sheet that's about 30% larger than the modern uh, global ice volume. And I'm gonna show you a nice summary figure in a couple of moments of what some, most of what the study, many of the studies are saying. 
Um, the CO2 records are not quite as clear, but there, there is a decrease across the boundary. Um, uh, but there is a decrease across the boundary. And I won't talk about it because we're probably running out of time. We're getting close to time at, at this point. Yeah, we're, so we're good. So we, we, get, we should wrap up. Um, basically, uh, there's some uh, precursor events that I won't go into, but it's, these are based on uh, cooling and ice volume increases as well. And so a summary of ice volume estimates for the Oligocene. So the bottom x-axis is the percent of present-day Antarctic ice sheets, about 62 meters, including West Antarctica. And this is the ice volume equivalent in apparent sea level. And these are different studies. This is from Antarctica, nations from Antarctica, paleoceanographic, uh, backstripped, so on and so forth. And what we're showing here is, you know, trying to build a consensus on glacial minima as well as glacial maxima. So the glacial minima we're talking about in terms of percent, we're talking about maybe as low as maybe only 25% of the modern, up to maybe about 70% during glacial minimum. Uh, the, OY, uh, the OI1 event, by the, by the way, is at the uh, Eocene Oligocene boundary. Um, and then the glacial maximum, we're looking at ice volume that is at least as large as today. And perhaps uh, if, if you include the, uh, the, cat, the Mimi Katz paper, it could be actually um, up to maybe about 140% of uh, the, um, uh, the current glacial ice volume. Okay. So, um, so as we're running out of time, let's just, uh, I'm just going to have a couple slides about the Middle Eocene. And for the Middle Eocene, um, the, the two paradigms is that there's no ice in Antarctica. And then the other paradigm is that there was probably, that there could have been small ephemeral ice sheets. Ephemeral, short lasting, only occurring during favorable orbital cycles and uh, insulation, for, uh, insulation forcing. And in oxygen isotope records, it's kind of difficult to see small ice volume changes because first of all, the ice would be probably warmer than Antarctica or Greenland today. So the, the ratio, the amount of oxygen isotope change per 10 meters of sea level change or ice volume would be very small. It would be very tough to see it in, um, in our oxygen isotope records. Uh, we can see it a little bit. And I'm gonna show you the next slide hope to kind of um, illustrate that. So we go to basically passive margins and sequences on passive margins. So here's some sites. This is from site 1171, which is a continental block south of Tasmania. Again, y-axis is age. Uh, then we have some stars, which is uh, sequence boundaries at site 1172, which is on another continental block uh, east of Tasmania. So it's actually on the East Tasman Rise. And site 1171 is on the South Tasman Rise, a different continental block. So any sort of local tectonics should not interfere, should, should not be involved here. And what we see is the blue represents sediments that are preserved at 1171. The little red represents sequence boundaries or inferred sea level lowering or water depth lowering. These are, um, uh, we also have sequences and sequence boundaries from New Jersey, as well as Alabama. And what we see is a pretty good correlation between especially these sea level, these sea level lowerings at 42, 44, 5, and, 40, and 47 million years ago. And so, and the only mechanisms for rapid large water depth changes uh, is ice volume, is ice volume on passive margins. So I did a little, uh, so um, Ken Miller in his 2005 paper using backstrip stratigraphy um, concluded that ice volume in the Eocene was episodic or ephemeral and the ice sheets were anything from maybe a third of the East Antarctic ice sheet size to maybe two thirds. And I did a little, you know, uh, back of the envelope study looking at oxygen isotope increases through the Eocene, looking at their increase, and then looking at low end sea level changes and high end sea level changes based on um, the ratio of oxygen to sea level, like the Rick Fairbanks calibration, as well as the percent ice signal in oxygen isotopes. So the percent of ice volume signal, like in the Pleistocene, is two thirds. I calculated for the Oligocene, it's probably like one third. 
in the Eocene, it could be even lower or at least as low as that. And so, so based on that, I uh, made some sea level, I calculated sea level changes and total sea level changes with some sea level cooling involved, which would result in contraction of the oceans and sea level fall. We have very similar, this is from 2005, um, sea level estimate changes on the order of a third to maybe half to up to maybe two thirds um, on the Antarctic continent. And these ice sheets would be basically restricted to the plateaus. This is an old study from the Kanto and Pola from two, 2003. So it doesn't include the, uh, the uh, Antarctic to topography. But uh, you can see that the ice sheets shown here are not reaching the coastline. And even with at 40 meters sea level, they get close to the coastline. And, but with the new topography, we can probably, they would definitely not reach the coastline. So, so let's conclude, get to, 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 the, uh, to the final part here, which what can these paleo records tell us about our future? And there's two big elephants in the room. And the first one is obviously, tectonics, landmass, oceanic differences through time. It's the further back you go in time, and that's when uh, CO2 is higher, the bigger the changes. Um, and as well as time scales. Today's is time scales. We're trying to figure out climate change at the decadal of the century, and we have thermal inertia involved, and the paleo climate records have the resolution of usually thousands of years. Like Ann Holborn's paper, the highest world resolution, oxygen isotope record I know of, the average resolution is two to 3,000 years resolution. So, so let's take a look at these uh, differences um, through time. First of all, there's the closing of the equatorial seaways. We have the Tethys Sea, or that becomes the Mediterranean, closing by the Middle Miocene. Um, we have the Panama Seaway that closes episodically starting around the Middle Miocene and complete closure from an isthmus by the Late Pliocene. And even today, we have another seaway that is becoming restricted, which is the Indonesian seaway that began restricting in around 8 million years. On the other side of the coin, instead of closing seaways, we have opening seaways in the Southern Ocean. And we have the Tasman Seaway, where that started opening around 50 million years ago. Um, the shallow water and the deep waters probably closed 34, 35 million years ago. We also have the Drake Passage, where some of the latest papers suggest that uh, shallow water uh, circulation started around 41 million years ago. Deep water is a little bit more controversial, anything from the late Eocene to the late Oligocene. And then the Antarctic circulation current, that started forming, uh, reaching more modern day levels, probably by the late Oligocene. And then we, of course, we have tectonic differences that can affect uh, regional climates and even the jet stream. We have the Himalaya Mountains, Tibetan Plateau, the Altiplano of Andes. While the, the mountains started building up starting 200 million years ago, most of the uplift of the high plateaus didn't occur until the last five to 10 million years. And the same thing with the Colorado Plateau. And so, and then it's the other elephant in the room is time scales. So today we're looking at a couple centuries. We're seeing we're going to be seeing CO two reaching hundreds of parts per million higher than pre-industrial. The last time we saw that was tens of millions of years ago. Temperatures could be rising up from pre-industrial to temperatures that we have not seen in tens of millions of years ago. So we're talking about very different things. The other thing is thermal inertia. Okay, today if we stopped all CO two, if the pandemic lasts for a long time, perhaps, where we can cut down CO2 for a little bit. Not that I want that. But, um, but at the same time, even if we stopped all CO2 emissions, we know, for, for you know, the people at guess here, we know that uh, climate is continue warming, thermal expansion of the oceans are going to continue, raising sea levels, and the melting of the ice sheets are going to continue. And here's an old diagram I found um, showing today, a hundred years from now to a thousand years. And what we're seeing is that CO2 stabilizes after a couple centuries, but look at sea level rise due to melting of the ice sheets. It's gonna take thousands of years, thousands of years. And my records are basically an equilibrium um, with, with the climate 
because uh, the climate's uh, in equilibrium with the climate forcing, like Milankovitch and insulation uh, and CO2, because CO2 and Milankovitch changes is happening so slow that climate can keep up with it. Climate cannot keep up with what's happening today, as we know. And so, so the take home message, while past climate records may not be totally useful for um, immediate uh, future changes, the long-term record should be an aid for future long-term changes. And so, so in conclusion, late Miocene climatic optimum, a late Miocene, um, we see basically episodic uh, Northern hemisphere glaciation. Whoops. During the middle Miocene climatic optimum, ice volume decreases by at least 50%. Due to, and um, we have CO2 levels at about 500 to 500 parts per million. During the early Miocene and Oligocene, uh, CO2 is even higher, up to 800. And during the glacial minimas, the ice sheet may have retreated by two, up to two thirds of its volume. In the middle of Eocene, CO2 levels are quite high, probably over 1,000 in some cases. And the ice sheet was only ephemeral, it all probably existed episodically with the ice sheet reaching up to maybe half to 60% of present uh, day East Antarctic ice sheet. And so just to conclude, paleo records, climate records can provide key insights to what our planet was like under elevated CO2 conditions. And I think that they can provide some insights for future cli climate changes, especially at the longer term, at the century to millennium timescales. And with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you. Okay, so are there any questions? Evan, do you have a uh, question? For me? Um, so the poor maneuvers you gathered, uh, would they have been found throughout the world or were they fairly localized samples from just specific spots. I may have missed that. I, I was gone for a minute. Were they just from specific well, that, spots that, by actually, the Antarctic? You didn't, miss, you didn't miss anything, actually. I just didn't mention it. And so, so this is a perfect question for, uh, for the whole. Uh, uh, Evan's actually in my class, in my historical geology class. So foraminiferas, uh, benthic foraminiferas will, uh, are marine organisms. They can live in the brackish water. And so they are uh, any place where environmental conditions are conducive in the marine to brackish waters. Uh, in very deep waters where the waters are corrosive, uh, calcareous foraminifers will dissolve, the shells will dissolve, and you'll basically only have a type of foraminifer called glutinated forams that basically just sticks sediment particles uh, together to make their shells. So the great question, thank you. Would that mean that the, uh, just to follow up then, sure. uh, would that mean the composition of them, uh, meaning the, uh, the uh, oxygen isotope composition, uh, would they change based on the latitude that they were dug up at? Uh, uh, well, for benthics, um, they will change based on the, the bottom water conditions. In okay. this case, it's mainly uh, bottom water temperatures in this case. But if you were looking at, say, platonic foraminifers, those are going to be constrained by latitude because surface waters, the surface water temperatures are going to be uh, constrained, are going to be affected by atmospheric temperatures. Got it. Okay. Great questions. Thank you so much. Any questions from a scientist, perhaps? We have, uh, does someone put their hand up here? Okay, um, well, let me take, take, my, take it out here. And can we see uh, the hand up? That would babble. Hi, Steve. Oh, hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Very good. Thanks so much, that was a, that was a nice talk. Um, I, I, I do, I mean, you now this is my own fault. Uh, I've, been, I've been working on this research coordination network for the last four years on, on compiling paleo CO2 data. So, um, many of the data that you've been that you've been talking about they're a little outdated um, yeah. not your fault uh, my fault I mean we I actually have a meeting with my colleagues this evening to uh, talk about writing a paper about this so there's something to look forward to at some point um, but for the um, 
I, I was I was curious when you when you said that um, for the magnesium calcium of the infaunal species that that is working a lot better than with the epifaunal species. You didn't show any data. Do you have? Can you can you show those data? What is your evidence that oh, that is working better it, than, than other ones? Actually, I could have pulled up to some of the Lear paper, and actually, I could have pulled up uh, some very preliminary data that I have for the middle Miocene uh, for temperature data, and it's um, where it's starting to show uh, that. Um, we don't see this anti-correlation taking place that, that we saw uh, using epifaunal uh, forminifera. So are they much more in phase then? Is that what you're are they much more in phase then? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, and then that's, uh, and in fact, you know, um, this is nothing, um, I'm not trying to um, denigrate anything with uh, the, the, these groups did. These are some of the best geochemists around mm -hmm. who are working on this proxy. Uh, uh, Carrie Lear and Yaira and El Eldersfield. And if you look at the long-term records, it makes sense. They do decrease across the EO boundary. Um, they do show ice volume changes. But when you look closely, we see this anti-correlation taking place. And this also occurred with uh, using even lithium calcium ratios where they try to use lithium calcium that also has the sensitivity to iron or carbonate iron saturation, mm -hmm. and it still showed up in somewhat. Mm -hmm. okay, so, and I'm not a total expert, but from what I've been seeing in the literature, um, Tropati, uh, Lear, and others are showing that, that it does seem to take out this anti-correlation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's promising. It's all, and, I, and in fact, I, I look forward to seeing your records Mm -hmm. uh, as well. Uh, in fact, if you have any preliminary data that you can share with me so I can include that in, in the future, that would be great. Uh, otherwise, the paper, I'll, I'll patiently wait for the manuscript to come out. Thanks, yeah. It looks a little sad just because we've, we've actually taken out a lot of the data that, science, that the experts are not really trusting anymore. Good. Okay, I mean, because I have new data in there, but there, but there are also there are some many data that have been removed. And so in, in some places, okay. it's pretty sparse right now, but it's, it's getting a clearer picture. Yeah, and, and to tell you the truth, um, uh, when I, and then during my talk, I said, you know, the, uh, the CO2 records that I was presenting, there seems to be a little bit of noise in there, okay? And, uh, and I am not an expert on CO2 estimates, so I'll leave it to you, but um, did some of, 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 the, um, of the data looked where it almost suggested that climate and CO2 were uh, out of phase or um, during anti-correlation, and so I'm glad that you're, you know, in a robust way, trying to pull out and see which data is not really working for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. thank you. This will really help the community a lot. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I know so. I know so. Thanks a lot. And I look forward to seeing you, uh, maybe not virtually, but maybe in six months or so at Lamont. Sure, hopefully sooner. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions? And that was a great, uh, thank you so much for sharing that because I'm not an expert on CO2. So it was great to have that. Any other questions from scientists or from students or from friends? Okay. Any hands being raised? I can't see anything here. I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Um, if we don't have any uh, final questions, uh, perhaps we should uh, wrap up as we're a little over time here. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, um, I want to thank everyone and I want to thank Craig for inviting me. Uh, thank you for watching the talk. If you have any follow up questions, um, please feel free to email me. My email is right here. Um, and uh, or any sort of discussion about ice volume, sea level, so on and so forth. Um, I would be interested in that. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, cheers, everyone. Have a good day. Okay, well, take care. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>